Welcome to Comics Crash Course. Today I'll be discussing the beginning of what's called the Silver Age in American comics. So this is, of course, in contrast to the Golden Age, which we've been talking about for a few weeks now. So before we move on, what's with this ages talk? Lots of things have Golden Ages. It tends to refer to an era of creative growth and intellectual exploration, of excellence and mastery on the one hand, but a certain kind of utopian innocence on the other. You'll hear of the golden age of this or that architecture, the four Islamic golden ages, the golden age of Hollywood, or the golden age of sale. In theory, there are subsequent metal ages, silver, bronze, etc., but you hear less about them, especially the further you get from gold. So the ages in American comics, they function a little differently. They are, to begin with, by no means official designations, and therefore the subject of many a late-night argument. No one's ever gotten together to agree on what exactly each age means or when they begin and end. In theory, they help categorize eras and create a narrative from comics' long history. In actuality, they're often used as a way to judge value, both qualitative and quantitative. Gold is worth more than silver, right? And Golden Age comics in good condition are often worth more money than Silver Age ones. That's due to their age and rarity. However, the qualitative argument gets a little harder to defend. While the Silver Age certainly wasn't as productive as the Golden Age, it's also a time of intense creativity and experimentation. But, as is often the case, fans who have been around longer like to think older things are better on principle as a sort of gatekeeping practice, a way to prove that they're the true fans compared to a newer generation. Of course, this isn't fans of all old comics. It just happens to happen in a lot of fandoms. You know, it's the I liked them before they were cool principle. Anyway, while it's true that there was amazing work produced in the Golden Age, equally excellent work is produced in the Silver Age, and arguably, overall, the technical quality of comics was better due to increased printing technologies. Of course, I'm sure people will disagree with me on that last point. So. Just to give a sense of where we're going and where we've been, the three most agreed upon ages of American comics are the Golden Age, which begins with the appearance of Superman in 1938, and ends with the establishment of the Comics Code Authority in 1954. The Silver Age, which picks up after the CCA and ends around 1970. The Bronze Age, which begins around 1970 and ends in the mid-1980s. The actual start and end dates of these ages is subject to a lot of debate as is the number of ages, whether there should be an interregnum between gold and silver, an age before the appearance of Action Comics number one, and what the heck comes after bronze. In fact, Alex Grand of comicbookhistorians.com argues that if we want to be really thorough, there should be eight ages. He makes some really interesting points and has some interesting categories, but most comics fans are really only familiar with the three that I've mentioned. So, to the Silver Age. To begin with, I see the Silver Age as being divided into two main movements. The first, which I'll discuss today, is closely associated with DC Comics. In this part, which also happens first chronologically, DC Comics focused on streamlining and reimagining Golden Age characters for more modern sensibilities, and at the same time they retooled superhero books to embrace broader scale adventures with more fantasy elements. During this era, DC also developed what is now called its house style, which meant that all of its books had a higher quality of art, but also a shared aesthetic, which resulted in a polished look across the whole line. However, due to the shared aesthetic, it became a little harder to emphasize the specific strengths of their artists as the house style became a higher priority. The second movement of the Silver Age is the Marvel Revolution, but that's for next week. As far as I'm concerned, there are three bell tolls that mark the beginning of the Silver Age. The first, as I've alluded to, were the events of 1954. In 1954, Wortham publishes Seduction of the Innocent, the Senate Subcommittee on Juvenile Delinquency holds its comic book hearings, and the Commerce Code Authority is established. The second bell is Famous Funnies number 218. If you remember, Famous Funnies was the first comic book made from mostly newspaper reprints. With issue 218, which stands in 1955, the series was cancelled. It's sort of inevitable for that to feel like the end of an era. And while the first two tolls mark ends, the third sounds a more hopeful tone. In 1956, DC Comics publishes Showcase Comics number 4. Showcase was an anthology series. It would feature shorter stories from a variety of characters. Some familiar, some new. It was often, in fact, used as a testing ground for new characters and ideas to see how audiences responded before, say, giving a character a whole own title to hold. In 1956, even DC was struggling with having been hit hard by the constriction in the comics industry. Only Batman, Wonder Woman, and Superman still had their own titles. We'll talk about what was happening with them in just a sec. In Showcase Comics number four, a 
brand new version of The Flash debuted on the very cool cover you see here. His costume was updated from the Golden Age, as was his backstory. And it was a huge hit, and due to the success of The Flash's update, within the next few years, other Golden Age heroes like the Green Lantern, Hawkman, the Atom, and Aquaman would all be similarly revamped. And then they would be brought together in a revamped Justice League. So due to the restrictions of the code, DC's mainstays, Superman, Batman, and Wonder Woman, had moved from being involved in real-world events like the war effort towards a more fantasy-oriented plot lines. And while this had certainly been happening since the war, by the mid-1950s, things were getting really pretty kooky. This is the era of the series Lois Lane, Superman's Girlfriend, where Lois turns into a baby and marries baby Superman. This is the era when Superman spends a lot of time in space and meets Brainiac, where Superboy meets Crypto the Superdog, and it's where the campy Batman that inspired the 1966 Batman TV show comes from. And by the way, that show had a huge impact on the comics industry. While it had originally been imagined as a fun but serious action program like The Man from U.N.C.L.E., producer William Dozier read the comics and realized it would work better as a pop camp comedy. The extraordinary popularity of the show resulted in sales of Batman comics practically doubling after the TV show's premiere, and the entire comics industry received a boost. As I briefly mentioned, one of the things DC did during this time was develop a house style, and the two artists most closely associated with this were Carmine Infantino and Kurt Swan. Carmine Infantino is best known for his work on The Flash. In fact, he's behind The Flash redesign and drew the cover for Showcase Comics number 4. He had been active during the Golden Age, and his first published work was the first appearance of the Black Canary. In 1967, Infantino was promoted to art director, and shortly thereafter became editorial director and then head publisher in 1971. So both as an artist and then in his tenure as directorial roles, he shaped the look of DC Comics for decades. He hired Dick Giordino away from Charlton Comics and also made artists Joe Orlando, Jim Kubert, and Mike Sikowski editors at DC. He was also influential in hiring new talents such as Neil Adams and Denny O'Neill, who would be hugely influential on DC's Bronze Age comics. Then there's Kurt Swan. Kurt Swan is practically synonymous with Superman. He drew his first Superman story in 1948 and would draw for action comics, Superman, Superman's girlfriend Lois Lane, Superman's pal Jimmy Olsen, World's Finest, and the Superboy stories and adventure comics. He was extremely prolific and would often draw two to three comics a month. He was so regularly worked with inker Murphy Anderson that the duo was frequently called Swanderson. He drew Superman until 1985, when DC gave the new Superman book to red-hot artist John Byrne after the 1985 event, Crisis on Infinite Earths. DC pretty much dropped him after having defined the image of Superman for three decades. Alan Moore's beautiful story, Whatever Happened to the Man of Tomorrow, was his last regular Superman story for DC. Swan is kind of a polarizing artist. For some, he's a classic illustrator who brought pathos and humanity to Superman. For others, he's kind of a workhorse tradesman who was technically clean but brought no real art or heart to the comics. I mean, I love Swan's work, but I can understand their critiques as well. The changes at DC worked. Superheroes were regaining popularity, and the comics seemed to finally be shaking some of the baggage of the moral panic from the early 50s. Meanwhile, in a classic comic transition, across New York City. Another company on the verge of bankruptcy, called Atlas, then Timely, was thinking about changing its name in one last effort to Marvel. But that's the next time. See you then.